The three most useless jobs in the world are, in order, lawyer, congressman, and doctor. Pass. Ron, that document is nothing. It's not even notarized. You know, if you die and you don't have a real will, most of what you... John Farrell with the Farrell Law Firm. To tell you a little bit about myself, I am the author of Estate Planning for the Modern Family and has recently voted one of the top lawyers in the county along with the law firm being voted one of the top law firms here in Cobb County, Georgia. Well, today we're going to review some of the most famous movies with estate planning scenes in them. You know, I've been practicing law for over two decades now and I've seen many movies and many television shows that address estate planning issues. And so today, we're going to uh, take a real lawyer, myself, and compare it with what you'll see in the movies versus movie lawyers and other uh, fictional estate planning scenes. So uh, let's dive right into it. First up is a movie called Knives Out. It came out a few years ago, and it is a movie that stars Daniel Craig, among many other people. And it is directed by and written by a director writer named Ryan Johnson. Uh, I think he is a fantastic director. It is a fantastic movie. And if you get a chance to watch it, I'd highly recommend it. Well, the other reason I thought this gathering would be uh, beneficial is because Harlan altered his will. All right, something like this never happens. This is something that you'll only see in the movies. And from time to time, people will call the office and they'll want to know, when is the reading of the will going to happen? Well, the reading of the will never happens. It's only something that you see in movies. You may continue. Right. Well, the other reason I thought this gathering would be uh, beneficial is because Harlan altered his will a week before he died. He sealed it. He asked me not to submit it to the courts for probate until after his death. All right, so probating a will is something that happens when a person passes away. And in this scene, it appears that Harlan, uh, the person who has passed away and whose will it looks like they are getting ready to read, um, asked that his will not be filed at the courthouse until after he has passed away. So that is a general rule. You can file a will before you pass away. And people used to do it. Uh, back in the old days, but it's not something that you'd do these days, and mainly it's because of the internet. People would file their wills down at the courthouse because, uh, you know, most likely they're gonna pass away within a few miles of the courthouse anyway. Uh, but these days, people travel, uh, they move from state to state, and it's not uh, as easy as just filing your will down at the local courthouse uh, where you expect to pass away when you, uh, you know, where, where you're gonna live when you pass away. Well, another reason you wouldn't want to file the will down at the courthouse is because wills are part of the public record. And with the internet, you can look up most of them online. So uh, if a young person were to take their will down at the courthouse, it would be on file and in the public record and viewable on the internet for many, many years. And so that is something we generally advise our clients not to do, to not file their will down at the courthouse before they pass away. Um, typically, you'll file the will after the person has passed away. Now, another thing that I find interesting about this is that um, the lawyer said that he altered his will a, a week before he passed away and that he sealed it. I'm not really sure where he's going with that, but uh, let's find out. Although I don't uh, imagine any of it is going to be that complicated, uh, Harlan's assets included... Um, the house. The house, which he owned up, right? Um, 60 million. Yes, 60 million in various cash accounts and investments. So that's pretty fascinating. So uh, the lawyer just said, you know, he didn't expect any of this to be complicated, but his client and the person who's passed away has an estate at least over 60 million. I can tell you $6 million estates are typically complicated. A $60 million estate is definitely going to be complicated if it has to go through probate. Uh, probate is a very long and drawn out process and no one has ever walked away from the probate court saying, well, that was very easy. Uh, so for the lawyer to say that uh, he doesn't expect it to be complicated, I can't imagine a $60 million estate going through probate to not to be complicated. Sole ownership of Blood Like Wine, his publishing company. 
He also wrote up a statement when he was making the changes and he wanted that read first. Dearest Linda, Walter, and Joni, some of you may be surprised by the choice I've made here. No pleasure was taken in the exclusion and its purpose was not to sow greater discord in the family, quite the opposite. Please accept it with grace and without bitterness, but do accept it, it's for the best, Dad. All right, so that's pretty interesting. So um, the lawyer read out a letter that was written by Harlan, the testator, the person that wrote the will, uh, with some guidance as to the will. And that's pretty unusual. It's not unheard of, but it's pretty unusual. So you can write a statement of intent or something of that nature to give guidance to the family before you pass away. Uh, it's pretty rare that it's done, um, and I can't remember the last time we did something like that here at the office. It is just a, a very rare event. Um, wow. Well, yeah, not too complex at all. Um, this will be all right, so that is... Uh, uh, and a, and a hilarious moment. It is hilarious uh, because the lawyer unsealed the envelope, pulled out one sheet of paper, and flipped it over like he expected there to be more from this, uh, what we would call a codicil, an amendment to a will. Uh, that tells me a lot of things. Number one, it tells me that it's possible that Harlan drafted his own amendment to the will which I would not recommend at all. Trying to do a codicil to your existing will is like trying to pull your own tooth. You might be able to do it, but you're gonna be much happier if you let a professional do it. So if you're thinking about doing a codicil or an amendment to your will, I highly recommend that you let an attorney do it for you. The second thing that this tells me is that this lawyer hasn't seen the amendment to the will. And is it possible that Harlan went to another lawyer to uh, get this amendment done? It's possible. Maybe this lawyer is like a family lawyer or something of that nature, not necessarily involved in the uh, preparing of estate planning documents. Uh, but there's nothing in the story to indicate that he uh, isn't the lawyer that handles all of Harlan's business. So the fact that he is surprised by the one-page amendment to the will is very surprising to me. Um, and I am just shocked that this would be that way. Um, maybe, but I give a lot of license to people who are writing movies and directing movies. Uh, so maybe they just wanted to portray that uh, this is a surprise to even the lawyer. Um, and it appears so because the lawyer flipped the page over expecting more. Um, and you would have more in uh, a codicil or an amendment to a will. It's very rare and almost impossible to do a one page amendment to a will. Trombie, being of sound mind and body and yada, yada, yada. I hereby direct that all my assets, both liquid and otherwise, I leave in their entirety to Marta Cabrera. My entire ownership of Blood Like Wine Publishing, I leave in its entirety to Marta Cabrera. The copyright of its catalog, likewise, I leave in its entirety to Marta Cabrera. Wow, so that's, uh, yeah, very interesting there. So um, what it appears is that uh, Harlan amended his will a week before he passed away leaving his entire estate to uh, Marta, who happens to be his caregiver. Um, I, I wish I could say that that was unusual, um, but it happens. Uh, interestingly enough, here in Georgia, you can disinherit everybody, uh, even your own spouse. So uh, in Georgia, uh, you could leave your estate to anybody that you wanted, as long as it met the requirements for a valid will or a valid codicil. In other words, if he did it a week before he passed away, um, was he of sound mind when he did it? Uh, he was obviously over 14, which is the minimum age here in Georgia, but uh, I happen to know he's the uh, grandfather, so uh, he certainly should be old enough to um, draft a codicil. But, uh, you know, the, with one page, you really don't know anything about the witnesses to the will. Uh, was the 
Um, document notarized, you don't necessarily need to have it notarized, but you'd want a notary handy so you wouldn't have to worry about trying to find the witnesses. Just a lot of things going on in this scene in particular. So the uh, big point to take away from this is that you shouldn't try to do these types of things yourself. We've all heard of the story of Aretha Franklin. She tried to do it herself and really just caused uh, just years of litigation uh, in her estate because uh, she tried to do some amendments to her will and um, really didn't do it properly. Uh, so here in this case, not sure if Harlan did it correctly, uh, but uh, he did uh, prepare an amendment apparently that left everything to his caregiver, which is something that you could do in Georgia. You might not be able to do that in every state, but you could at least do that here in Georgia. All right, the next scene we are going to review is uh, in Harry Potter. Uh, quite honestly, I haven't seen any of the Harry Potter movies, and I don't really know much about it. This one happens to be titled, uh, I think, Dumbledore's Last Will and Testament. So we're going to review it, see what kind of estate planning lessons we can learn uh, from this scene from the Harry Potter movies. Uh, I think Harry Potter is a wizard or wants to be a wizard, and he's got friends who are either wizards or want to be wizards, and that's kind of really all I know about the Harry Potter movies. So let's check it out. This is... So all of our meetings here at the Farrell Law Firm happened that way. The documents just flowed in the air. Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. First, to Ronald Billius Weasley, I leave my Deluminator, a device of my own making in the hope that when things seem most dark, it will show him the light. So this is something that we would call a specific bequest and, or a specific distribution. And what it is is when you specifically leave an item, most oftentimes it is a personal item, uh, but it could be something like a home, uh, something with a title to it but you specifically leave an item to a specific person. I suppose that's why they call it a specific distribution. In this case, it looks like there was some type of device he wanted to leave to an individual. And in the wills that we prepare, we do have a section for specific distributions and something like that would end up there. In other words, he wanted this specific device to go to this specific individual. To Hermione Jean Granger, I leave my copy of the Tales of Beadle the Bard in the hope that she find it entertaining and instructive. Mommy me serving me those. Another specific request, uh, giving a book to a person. To Harry James Porter. I leave the snitch he caught in his first Quidditch match at Hogwarts as a reminder of the rewards of perseverance and skill. I have no idea what that is. Dumbledore left you a second bequest. The sword of Godric Gryffindor. Unfortunately, the sword of Gryffindor was not Dumbledore's to give away. And in any event, the current whereabouts of the sword are unknown. Excuse me? The sword is missing. All right, so this is a very interesting topic because apparently uh, the person left a sword to Harry Potter, uh, but a couple of issues was uh, brought up. Uh, first, it wasn't his to give away. Yeah, you can only give away the things that you own. So, you know, I can't give away um, Bill Gates's fortune because I don't own it. Uh, but uh, the second thing that was brought up was that although he imagined that he did own the sword and now the sword is nowhere to be found. So an issue is a, uh, comes up, you know, what do they do? Do they give Harry a, an item uh, of, of, you know, equal value? Uh, maybe, maybe the sword was worth 25000 and 
Do they now give $25,000 in cash to Harry as a replacement for the sword that uh, is no longer there? Uh, maybe he owned the sword and maybe he gave it to someone else before he passed away, but never went around to changing his last will and testament. This is called an ademption, and so it's a very complicated uh, legal phrase that we use in last wills and testaments. Um, and it relates to, well, if I give a specific distribution to someone and that item has either been given away or I no longer uh, own it or you can't find it, what do we do? And we address those things, whether they need to give something of equal value or whether it just lapses because it is no longer owned uh, by the person who passed away. Uh, so a very interesting little concept there that they brought up in uh, Harry Potter. All right, the next video we have to watch is with Ron Swanson from Parks and Recreation. Uh, Parks and Recreation is a fantastic show. Um, Ron Swanson is one of the main characters there, uh, and he is discussing his last will and testament. So Leslie and I just finished putting together our will, and she wants you to be the witness. You mind signing it? That's your will? You need that many pages to say give my stuff to my wife? It's a complicated legal document. Doesn't have to be. I've had the same will since I was eight years old. So Ron apparently wrote a will when he was eight years old, and it looks like something an eight-year-old would write. And obviously, um, you can handwrite a will in most states. Uh, you can here in Georgia. Uh, but it still has to meet the requirements for a valid will. In other words, there has to be witnesses. Um, uh, you have to be of sound mind. How do you prove those types of things? And so... There are things that have to be in a will to make it valid. <clears throat> and writing a will on a, or scribbling a will really, on a real small piece of paper, really is going to cut it here in Georgia. So Ron's will that he wrote when he was eight years old uh, really wouldn't cut the mustard here in Georgia. Okay, you, you should really have a will that's more than one sentence long. You have a wife and kids now. I could introduce you to our lawyer. The three most useless jobs in the world are, in order, lawyer, congressman, and doctor. Pass. Ron, that document is nothing. It's not even notarized. You know, if you die and you don't have a real will, most of what you own will go to the government. Where is this lawyer you speak of? All right, just let me do the talking here, okay? I mean, he's a lawyer. All right, so one of the things he mentioned was that uh, the will has to be notarized. Um, a will does not have to be notarized, at least not here in Georgia and most states. You do want to have a notary handy, but not to make the will valid. Um, you typically need witnesses, uh, but you don't necessarily need a notary. The reason you want a notary is because of a document that goes along with the last will and testament. Uh, here in Georgia, we call it the self-proving affidavit. And it's a document that says, hey, I was there, I saw the person sign it, they were over 14, they were sound mind, all the things that make a will valid. The reason you want this document is because if you don't have something like this, you'll have to find the witnesses when the person passes away, which could be many years down the road. So having a notary handy so they can um, execute this self-proving affidavit is extremely helpful. As a matter of fact, here in Georgia, if you don't do a self-proving affidavit along with a will that has been prepared, you're probably practice, uh, committing malpractice. Um, I guess there are other people that will determine that type of thing, but the self-proving affidavit is just a standard document that goes along with your last will and testament, so the family doesn't have to worry about trying to find the witnesses later on. The second thing he mentioned was that, you know, if you don't have a will, uh, most everything that you have is going to go to the government. Well, that's just not true. Um, that is, uh, I'll give them creative license for it because it convinces Ron that he needs to go on and, and prepare a real will, um, a valid will. Um, but in real life, uh, no. Um, if you pass away, most of your estate will not end up going to the government. Now, it could in the form of estate taxes if that's something that you have to worry about. Uh, here in Georgia, for the most part, people don't have to worry about the estate tax because Georgia got rid of its estate tax a few years ago. Uh, there's still a federal estate tax, but the exemption is so high that most people don't have to worry about it. So in reality, most of the time, uh, if you were to pass away without a will, your things would still go to your family. Maybe not necessarily the family that you wanted to go to, 
But in reality, it's probably going to end up going to your family. Just a few years ago, there was a case, I think it was out of Chicago, uh, where it's the largest unclaimed estate in American history. Uh, this guy left behind, I think it was about $20 million and uh, didn't have a will or a estate plan. Uh, well, they spent maybe three or four years, I believe, finding 400 of his closest relatives so that they can divide his estate out amongst them. Uh, so even in that case, uh, most of it didn't end up with going to uh, the government. In reality, a lot of it probably ended up with the lawyers because uh, they went out and tried to try to find these people, and I'm sure it took a long time. Well, it took in, in about three or four years. So a lot of the estate probably ended up going to the lawyers, which would really would have been unnecessary had he just went out and got a valid last will and testament. So in this case, Ron's estate wouldn't necessarily go to the government, um, but uh, maybe end up going a lot to lawyers who have to try to figure out who it should go to if he passed away without a last will and testament. Mr. Swanson, let's begin by filling out this form listing your assets and liabilities. Nice try. I'm not telling you how much money I have, where it's hidden, or which precious metals and or gemstones it may or may not take the form of. If you don't give me the information I need, there's nothing I can do. Oh, come on, Trevor, where there's a will, there's a way. I'm gonna say this one last time, Wyatt. Check the accountant crap at the door. Yes, sir, I will. All right, so the lawyer wanted him to fill out a short questionnaire, uh, and that is a very common practice. Every now and then people will come into the office and they just don't want to give you that information. And really what they're trying to do is figure out if you're the person that they wanna work with. So, um, Without filling out the paperwork, it's really hard for us to give you the best legal advice uh, we could. It'd be like going to see a doctor and not letting them examine you. Um, how are they going to give you medical advice really without checking you out? So it's kind of that way with lawyers. Uh, if you don't provide us with some basic information, it's going to be really hard for us to give you the best advice we could. So. You're protected by the attorney-client privilege, maybe not necessarily in this scene because Ben is sitting in the office. Uh, you don't want other people who aren't related to you, and usually you don't even want people who are related to you sitting in the room because it could um, end the attorney-client privilege or break the attorney-client privilege. So you want to discuss these things in private with your lawyer because then it's protected by the attorney-client privilege and whatever information you provide or uh, tell the lawyer, it's going to be protected from disclosure. So this is not something that you get with financial advisors or with what we call trust mills. Uh, so when you're going out and you're filling out this information online with LegalZoom and all these other places, uh, your information isn't protected. They're, they're not lawyers, and so they're not bound by the attorney-client privilege. Uh, in this case, Ron should really just give the information to the lawyer so that he can give him the best information that he can. Fine. A ballpark figure. Thank you. God. Holy <laughs> Is this a joke? Another word for jokes is lies. I do not lie, therefore I do not joke. Mr. Swanson, an estate of this size means that your children would never have to work a day in their lives. This is going to take some time. Trusts need to be drawn, tax shelters. That's enough. So this uh, television show takes place in Indiana, and I, I'm really not familiar with the laws of Indiana. I don't practice there. I practice in Georgia, Tennessee, and Texas. Uh, and so I don't know the value of Ron's estate, but it appears that it may cross the ta uh, estate tax threshold um, because he's wanting to set up tax shelters and various trusts. Um, so it appears that Ron has uh, done a really good job of uh, keeping the money that he makes and really building it and has really grown his estate to um, a very nice one because the lawyer was taken back a little bit by the ballpark figure that he was giving. Most of the time, he's right. We can work with a ballpark figure. If you're close to the estate tax line, then we may have to get into some more specifics, uh, into details about uh, the value of the estate and where these items are and what form they take. Um, so um, these are um, the types of things that uh, we really need to know. So, But maybe starting with a ballpark really is a good place. Here's my original will. Do whatever lawyer nonsense you have to to make it official, and I will sign it. Good day. Wait, what are all these symbols? <laughs> I was right not to be threatened by you. Yeah, so Ron says the three most useless professions in order are 
lawyer, congressman, and doctor. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, sometimes it's hard to argue with people like that. Uh, but a lawyer really will be able to help him uh, plan his estate, make sure everything goes to where it needs to go. So the next scene we're going to watch is from the television show Frasier. Not the reboot of Frasier, but the original Frasier, the one that was set in uh, Seattle. Uh, I happen to know this scene. I think I remember it uh, pretty well. I think that uh, maybe Frasier was um, faced against his own, or facing his own mortality and realized he needed to take care of his affairs while he could, and he has the family around and he wants to discuss it. Dad, Niles, I'd like you to put your names on these stickers and place them on any of the objects that you would like bequeathed to you. <laughs> this is crazy. I'm not going to start putting my name on your stuff. Dad, Dad, what happens if I die tomorrow? You and I'll set up an argument over that, well, that African mask, for instance. It'll never happen. All right, so that's uh, pretty interesting. So it looks like what Frazier is doing is he's wanting to discuss the distribution of perhaps personal items related to him. Uh, there are different ways to handle something like that. So what he indicated was, hey, um, here are some stickers, put your name on the sticker, and then go around the room or around the condo and put your sticker on the things that you'll want if I were to pass away. That is certainly one way you can do it. Uh, I don't know that I'd recommend doing it that way uh, because uh, I'm sure Frazier has a long, long life ahead of him and those stickers are likely to come off or be misplaced as time goes on. The better way to do it is through something called a personal property memorandum. Uh, in that document, which gets attached to your last will and testament, you can indicate the item and who it goes to. You sign it dated at the bottom. Uh, your will would reference that personal property memorandum so that when you pass away, they'll look for that personal property memorandum and the personal items that you've listed on it and who you want them to go to versus having people go around and putting stickers on the things that they want before you pass away. Uh, so there's really just a better way to do it. This is taking it too far. Will you look at this? Burial. Casket. Caterers? Ooh. Who are you using? Michelson's. Oh, they're very good. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Yes, oh, yes, yes. They're bow tie pasta. They have a seat. Excuse me. Excuse me. Who are you about? All right, so that is pretty interesting. So uh, he wanted to discuss his burial and funeral wishes, and he mentioned that he had a binder. It's really interesting. Sometimes people don't have those conversations with their families. You know, they won't mention to their families, you know, whether they want to be uh, buried or cremated, where they want to be buried, whether they want music played, maybe they want scripture read, uh, if they have any religious beliefs that want to be followed. Uh, so those things, you know, sometimes aren't discussed with family. Well, one of the things that we do here is that we do provide a binder. We call it a portfolio, but it's a binder. Uh, and there's a section in that portfolio that you can describe your burial and funeral wishes. And so typically what people will do is they will write into that section the things that they want to have happen, like who they want their caterer to be, like Frazier mentioned. Um, and so that way, when before they pass away, they just tell their family, hey, if something happens to me, just find this portfolio, and in it, you will see my burial and funeral wishes. Um, one thing that you wouldn't do is you wouldn't put your burial and funeral wishes in your last will and testament for a very practical reason. The main reason is that by the time anybody reads the last will and testament, the funeral is long gone. And so they'll read what your burial and funeral wishes are well after that funeral has taken place. And so you wouldn't want to put your burial and funeral wishes in your will. It's a very antiquated way of doing it. Instead, uh, you want to provide some type of guidance to your family, either verbal, but the better way is to write it down so that they will know what your burial and funeral wishes are before uh, that day comes. Celebrate life with a bottle of Chateau Sartre 75. Oh, no, not 75. I can't let you do that. That's far too good for the likes of us. Well, you know, perhaps a Beaujolais Nouveau would be more appropriate. Yes. All right, so that does seem like something a brother would do, doesn't it? And um, so at the end, he said, uh, you know, let's uh, just uh, go on and let's celebrate life a little bit and grabbed a bottle of wine and his brother decided to put a sticker on there with his name on it. Uh, yeah, so um, that is uh, very interesting. 
um, section there, a video with Frazier talking about his uh, end of days and what he wants to have happen with his personal items and uh, his burial and funeral wishes. Uh, yeah, really topics that everybody should have with their family, but uh, I can understand it. Not everybody wants to have those uh, conversations with their families. If you don't, get you a portfolio like the kinds that we provide, and you can put that type of information in there that they can see later on. All right, that's really all we have to talk about today. If you've watched our videos for any amount of time, then you know what we do is we help people plan their estates. To do that, we've created a book called Estate Planning for the Modern Family. You're going to want to get a copy of this book, so I'm putting a link in the description below so you can order it online. It will tell you all that you need to know about wills, trusts, uh, powers of attorney, advanced directives, and the probate process. The book also comes with a bonus, and the bonus is if you have trouble sleeping at night, you can read through it and it will get you right to sleep, so make sure you read it in the morning. If you want to learn a little bit more about myself or maybe the firm or maybe schedule a free consultation for yourself, give us a call at 678-809-4922. That's 678-809-4922, where you can schedule that free consultation for yourself. All right, that's really all we have to talk about today. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. We put out new videos almost every day. And make sure you hit the like button because, hey, every like helps.